I threw the Bible to some women with good character, some women with very bad character, like the men in the Bible, some men with very good character, some men with very, uh, 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 did I say good or bad for the men? That's good. That's it. So some memories are very bad as well, the opposite. So, right? so we, we get all that. But it's more as with women, um, is, is kind of the Lord has Old Testament and New from creation to the end, some very specific instructions for women, which we're going to come to on Sunday. And, of course, it, it's a difficult thing because we need to do a, a, at least a month of Sundays in the study of women to try and, try and nail down and knuckle down and the exact kind of and the context of where they all sit. Because when we... Dealing with the New Testament, the three things that jump out of silence, submission, and subjection. And of course, without any context to those whatsoever, uh, any women who are unsaved, any women who are newly saved, and any women who have been saved a while and don't read the Bible without any understanding of the context, they just leap out of their skin metaphorically and they've got no clue. And that may well happen on Sunday. So, what I've done tonight is I wanted to take a look at a side study uh, that I didn't want to just bring into the sermon, if you will, on Sunday or make it a series of sermons. I just want to kind of preach on the context of where we'll be on day. So whilst this stands as a study alone, it's particularly set so that we've got something uh, recorded, something on the site uh, that I can point any of our ladies to who are perhaps immature or new Christians and may not grasp something properly on Sunday or certainly won't have time to, to explain everything to make sure everybody's got full understanding on Sunday. And we can just point them back to this as a very brief, it's a very brief study. It's a huge topic, of course, uh, and that's um, that's looking at the equality of women in the scriptures. All right, which uh, which is kind of a, a subject in a sense, which I thought would be a good title to have um, because that will usually get most people's attention. Most people who know the Bible are thinking, "Hmm, where's he going with this?" And those who don't will think, "Oh, wonderful!" And hopefully, either way, it would draw draw us all in to have a quick look at that. So we're going to various texts this evening as we look at this uh, subject in the Bible. So this really is an addendum or appendix to Sunday's sermon. I know, of course, an addendum or an appendix normally comes after the main volume of the book, but this will uh, sit alongside that we can point people to if it's a help, and I think it will be for some who don't have a great understanding of the scriptures, particularly with relationship to the roles of men and women, um, which sit very distinctively in the New Testament as they do as the old. You know, you have a lot of people come to it with the impression of simple patriarchal misogyny and mistaken understandings and terrible biblical things. And, you know, God God couldn't really mean those things anymore because he's a good and loving God and he's a God who just, you know, was on side for feminism and all the rest of it. And so we need a scriptural... Uh, introduction, if you will, to make sure uh, that we've all got that. Now, I'm sure probably tonight we probably all have, so this is for the purposes. But it doesn't hurt to have some one or two refreshers, and my aim is to not then go over the same text again on Sunday, so that, that is that is the hope tonight. But in preparation, let's just go to Genesis 1 anyway, have your Bibles open in uh, Genesis chapter 1, uh, just in preparation for where we'll go in a minute. Uh, and just to say this, really, because biblical, biblical femininity... Biblical femininity has been replaced by unbiblical feminism. You know, you've heard me say that before. Now, we anticipate that out in the world now because the, the ripple effect of the word of God has been long thrown out of everywhere from preschool up to nurses and homes and hospitals. So ripple effects of Christianity, the ripple effects of the word of God are pretty much flatline like flatness on a mill pond again now. Um, but this is also the case in the churches today. Because we've got people who are not reading the scriptures, we've got people who are not preaching the scriptures, and therefore the, the mindset within the church is to take whatever seems appropriate for today's world in our cultural context and make that the mandate of authority for the church. And what we will find, if that's the case, is there's a great divide. The two do not line up, particularly in the society that we live in today. You know, we could probably point to things of the past and say there were elements of, of the roles of women and women in society where, where they weren't a million miles apart from the teaching of the church. And, of course, it is a big role because you've got the role of women in society, you've got the role of women in church, the role of women in marriage, the role of women in motherhood, the role of single women who are ladies, the role of young ladies, the role of young girls, as the scriptures say, who should become polished cornerstones. You know, there's so many areas to look at. But what has happened, if, if, if we have 
a number of Christian women who are not familiar with and or reading the scriptures, even if they don't overtly choose the feminism of the world, you end up with a semi-conscious stirring from within. You end up with a growing discontent and discomfort when we touch anywhere near the scriptural role of women. It's, it starts to become like an anathema because they're not taking the scriptures in, they're taking the world in, and they're so full of the world that that just little bit of scripture goes then against everything that has become the preset, even subconsciously. That, that decision that Christian women can make not to study the scriptures, not to listen to the scriptures, not to put themselves in biblical preaching and teaching churches, that then, of course, when they come across the scriptures as they read them, they need to change the Bibles and re-soften the Bibles and come down to the got little more than a comic with Jesus' name in, in the hand, or they've got to keep shuffling around the churches till they get to the tear and share with the pastorette where they start to feel very comfortable and, uh, and all the rest of it. And what happens is, very, very quietly, relevant biblical truths are replaced with unbiblical thoughts and actions and of course we don't want to see that at all in this church and praise the lord uh, we don't suffer with that as an issue but we don't want that to to start now we do understand that some of this of course understandably is a reaction to some of the past sinful actions of religion tradition that's always a problem uh, so we need to understand what say the scriptures of course don't we um, you know, and even where you get then unbiblical, if you will, to use the word that's a nonsense word, male chauvinism or, or male dominance that then exceeds the role that's given to in the scriptures, then you understand, you know, if you, if you push too far the one way, then you get a reaction that goes worldly different. So we're, we're always searching for, we want to find the dead center of biblical truth. And we shuffle around that a little bit. Sometimes you have to narrow that down, but we want to be there. But let me say this, no matter what has happened in the past, no matter what happens today in regards of tradition and our society and unbiblical actions, it does not negate the scriptural teaching on the specificity of God's requirement of the biblical roles for biblical manhood and biblical womanhood. And that's where we're going to really focus tonight. Now, that comes down into the two terms, two theological terms you may already be familiar with. If, if not, as you study this thing, you're going to come across them. And that is uh, complementarianism and egalitarianism. Complementarianism and egalitarianism. They're two views, uh, theological views, on the relation specifically between men and women, uh, and biblical relationship between men and women, and particularly within relation to marriage and ministry, although not exclusively just linked into those uh, two roles, if you will. Complementarianism, just to give you a quick definition, emphasizes that. That although men and women are equal in their personhood, Christ, they are created for different roles and were so before the fall. And that's important. Okay? So men and women, God created them, male and female, distinctively different and specifically for separate roles from the very beginning. And from the very beginning, i.e. prior to the fall, that was the case. That would be the complementarian position. And just to let you on a hint, that would be the more biblical position. The other side of the argument, and I would say what has become ever more the common side, in Western Christianity at least, is egalitarianism. And this agrees that men and women are equal in personhood. I have to read this one because I'm not familiar with how they define this. Uh, agrees that men and women, I'm familiar with the outflow of it, but not the definition. Uh, men and women are equal in personhood, but holds that there are no gender-based biblical limitations on the roles of men and women. And they use as the primary base for the argument for that now is that it's always usually directed at the writings of the Apostle Paul. Usually most incorrect theological things are. And they hold that Paul was a male chauvinist. They hold Paul was a product of his culture at the time, or they hold that that cultural relativism was particularly specific in the epistles of Paul because he was dealing more in the Gentile world, so it only really had cultural relevance because of the pagan Greek Gentile world that Paul was dealing in at the time, but doesn't have application anymore to our 20th and 21st century cultural enlightenment and understanding. Therefore, we can put those things aside from the Bible. They're old-fashioned and they're cultural. 
Isn't it always amazing how always the bits everybody wants to leave out that apparently are no longer relevant in the Bible? As long as we just kind of hang on to the gospel and rescue and go out and win. What, 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 what nonsense. So there's that argument of cultural relativism. This is in the egalitarian point of view. And the other one is, is that everything is referred to in the New Testament scriptures in relation to the roles of men and women and the Old Testament as well are a product of the fall. And therefore, what we need to do as enlightened 21st century thinking Christians is now to scrap all of those patriarchal, misogynistic products of all, and we now need to correct God's word and make it right for the 21st century. See, you kind of get that argument. It goes across the board, but that's where it sits in the difference between complementarianism and egalitarianism. So we'll look, first of all, at equality and dignity in the eyes of the law. What's God got to say about the thing? And most importantly, what has God got to say about the thing at the start? Not only has what God got to say, what did he tell us right at the very beginning? So we, we need to go right back to the creation, don't we? Look at the, at the beginning, and we're in Genesis 1. So let's go to Genesis verse number 27. <clears throat> Genesis chapter 1, verse number 27. So God created man in his own image, in the image of God created he him, male and female created he them. And just the very quote of that word is enough to stir up a whole hornet's nest across a whole raft of our society today, isn't it? So let's take a minute and let's just pray for the Lord's help tonight as we look at this, this law of equality for women. Father, we come before your word tonight. We bow before your word. We humble ourselves before your word. Your word is our final authority for all matters of faith and practice. And Lord, inevitably, not only as a pastor, but as a people in here tonight, we will fail on occasion, we'll fall short on occasion, we'll have to redefine things on occasion. But our God, there are so many all clear and are only muddied by the waters of sin and culture. And we pray that, that those things in and of themselves will not become the distinguishing authorities for our church. And we pray for churches up and down our land and in the West in particular, the enlightened West. That is so far from light, it's complete darkness. So, Lord, help us tonight with this subject that can be sensitive. Lord, bless our women in particular with a, with a hearing ear and a sensitive heart. Help me, Father, just to be clear and, and to be understandable. And we pray, Lord, that our, that our ladies will, Father, receive the teachings, stand through the years to come, we pray, and will become godly Christian biblical women. And we pray for us as men, Lord, that we will not let the sins of our evil Ego and our pride, uh, help us to overstep your biblical marks and boundaries. We'll rise up as well and stand for the roles that you have provided to us in light of our great Creator, in light of our great Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. In His name we pray. Amen. Amen. So Genesis 1 27 tells us something very specific God is our Creator and our Savior, of course. He takes us right back to the beginning, our beginning, not His beginning. He created man, that's mankind. Uh, you know, we don't do much study on the Hebrew words and don't need to. Man generally throughout the book of Genesis or the early part is, is Adam. That's what it means for, uh, we get the name Adam, but Adam means man generically, as in Adam, man and woman. But it also, of course, where it relates to Adam specifically <coughs> is in the role of a man created male. So it's very, very specific. So we've got generic meaning of man, including man and woman, as we have in this verse. Then we also have specific reference to a male man as opposed to a female man. And, of course, we won't waste any time in discussion of anything in between because there is nothing in between, no matter what anybody would like to do to themselves. It doesn't change who you are. So since the first day that God created us, God created man in his own image, in the image of God created he him, male and female created he them. Since the first day, men and women both have the privilege of being representative of God himself. Now, of course, we are now subject to the fall. Um, but this is the time of perfection, of course, so they, they were created in the image of God. Now, God is a spirit, of course, but God came to earth and took on human form, but God himself is spirit. 
So we could spend very much time talking about what the image of God means, his attributes, his qualities, his character, and everything else. But we can, we can just sum that up and suppose that up, that as Adam and Eve were created by God in the image of God, therefore they represented God, if you will, to some degree in human form, although they were not God. Very human, all right? But they were representative they were, uh, they were of the image of what God wanted to display in human form of his own character before the fall. And male and female shared that position equally. Genesis 1.27 shows us that it was absolutely equally in the image of God. Okay, now we could go all the, the run of that and how that works, but I think you understand that here tonight. You don't need me to, to run through that. And in fact, that's so important because even in the Bible, there is a higher creation than us, right? Angelic beings. But even the higher creation than us, the angelic beings, are nowhere referred to in Scripture as being in the image of God. That is something that was unique to God's creation of male and female. So that's quite important. Quite important. It's unique to us. Yes, we now retain Adam's marred image, if you will, but there is still something of the image of God even within us today as male and female, uh, particularly for us who are Christians as new creatures in Christ. That's a, a whole different ballgame. So if they were equal in terms of the image of God, in terms of God's creation, the question arises, then was there a difference in the responsibility, in the authority, and maybe the accountability between these who were both Adam at this time, by the way? She was not yet Eve, was she? She was named Eve when she became the mother of all living. All right? At this point in time, they're both called Adam, but one's male and one's female. You find that in Genesis 5. We're going to get back to that for a second. So if they're equal, what we need to see then, right from the beginning, because this is so important, did God give them the same roles, male and female? Did he give them the same responsibilities, male and female? Did he give them the same accountability, male and female? Or right from the very beginning, right from creation, right from before the fall, did God say there is a difference in role, responsibility, and accountability? Because if so, then that holds to all time, we dismiss the argument then that, that all the difference is a result of the fall. So still in Genesis chapter 2, please, or sorry, going into chapter 2, <clears throat> let's look at verse number 7. So now we get a little bit more detail in the chronology of the creation of man and woman, or male and female. Verse number 7, And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living soul. His nostrils, this is the formation of Adam, male, created first. Preeminence in creation. God created the male man first. Now just jump down to verse 18. So we know that um, Adam was put in the garden. We know that he was called to name the names of the animals and so on and so forth. We know that Adam was given the instruction not to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Verse number 18, and the Lord God said, it is not good that the man should be alone. Okay, so we know we're just dealing with male Adam up to this point. And God says it's not good for him to be alone. And we know through our familiarity with the book of Genesis and the naming of all the animals, there was not found anybody suitable for him, so we're going to go into now. It's not good that the man should be alone. By the way, that, that does run today. God, God calls some people very specially and very uniquely to be single for him. But the normal position, you know, he that findeth a wife findeth a good thing. It's not good for a man to be alone. A uh, man should be married. That's God's primary plan for the family and for usefulness and for fruitfulness and for our society and for just for every part of everything 
is, is blessed only when families, and by that I mean biblical families, not the modern invention of society. Uh, you know, what, what do you call two men who live together uh, and have adopted a child? Father and father? No. Two men looking after a child is what you call them. What do you call two women who live together and have adopted a child? Mother and mother? No. Two women looking after a child. They are not a family. They are the very epitome of something that is diametrically opposed to the family. And it is not good for the child because it's not following God's plan. Doesn't mean there can't be some benefits that may God may allow some benefits, but primarily we are sowing the wind and reaping a whirlwind. And if God gives us enough time, the whirlwind is coming as a result of messed up non-biblical family. That's another message. It's not good the man be alone, I will make him and help meet for him. Adam, male, man, first created. God says it's not good for him to be alone. I will make somebody to do exactly the same as Adam. I'm going to make two of them. Is that what it says? I will make him a help, meet, suitable for him. God decided that the next person created was somebody specifically to be alongside helping Adam and would be suitable to help him as he did what the Lord called him to do. Verse number 19, out of the ground, the Lord God formed every beast of the field, every fowl of the air, and brought them unto Adam to see what he would call them. And whatsoever Adam called every living creature, that was the name thereof. Now, there's a change there, because remember in the creation account, you know, God called the, the sun, the moon, the day, the night. God's naming everything, right? Now, Adam is naming things. Some responsibility has been committed to Adam. There's a shift. Verse number 20. And Adam gave the names to all cattle, to the fowl of the air, to every beast of the field. But for Adam there was not found an help meet for him. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept. And he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he a woman and brought her unto the man. And Adam said, this is now bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Who named her? God or Adam? Adam. Adam. So we've got equality, the rib pictures side by side. You know, we go through all those illustrations. But Adam was created first. Adam needed a help. Adam has been given some authority already by God prior to the creation of the woman. And at the creation of the woman, Adam names her woman. Now, whether that's because it means womb of man, there's lots of things that have been speculated about that, because she was taken out of a man. So the creation order was not insignificant to the Testament reader. All through the Old Testament, they recognized the creation order in that Adam was created before Eve. Eve was created equally before God in value, but specifically for a particular role. And Adam already had an authority that was not given to Eve at creation. There was a difference of responsibility and accountability to God right from the creation in perfection, not as a result of the fall. So the Old Testament reader, the Old Testament who lived in the Old Testament, to so then that meant something. But of course, we're in the New Testament, and it's not the Old Testament goes out the window. And of course, if we listen to a lot of professing Christianity today, well, it's all just grace. There are rules, there are no responsibilities, there is no regulation, male or female, we're all one, we're all saved, we're all the same, and all of that old-fashioned stuff about silence, submission, subjection, roles and relationships to women in the Bible, that's all now fuddy-duddy, out of date, and culturally irrelevant. Well, not to the writers of the New Testament who wrote under the inspiration of God, i.e. they were the human penmen of God's 
God's Word. Now, of course, we'll go to where we're going on Sunday. We won't labor along there because we come back Sunday. So go back to 1 Timothy, or go to 1 Timothy, I should say. Because this is what we'll be looking at on Sunday. But just to give you a New Testament picture that takes us all the way back to that creation account that we just looked at. And that's so important. You know, you've got these Christians who claim not to not to believe in creation, but to believe in Jesus. But Jesus believed in creation and spoke of it. You know, these things that make no sense whatsoever. So now we have the same thing. Oh, I believe in Jesus, and Jesus was a social reformer, and Jesus was all for, for you know, equality and so on and so forth. And, uh, uh, yeah, the New Testament, it removes all of those things. They were all about cultural relativism. But we find now the Apostle Paul and the inspiration of God doing exactly the same thing that Jesus did. Take takes us all the way back to the creation account for the authority of a New Testament command from God. And in 1 Timothy chapter 2, uh, we'll just start uh, from verse 12 tonight. But I suffer not a woman to teach, nor to usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. I'm not covering that tonight, we're covering that on Sunday. But look what he says in verse 13. For Adam was first formed, then Eve. See what Paul's saying? Paul's saying all the way back to the creation, we must not overshoot the distinction that God gave in creation that Adam was formed first, then Eve. It is not an irrelevant fact. It is not a historical fact. It is not a patriarchal corruption of God's wonderful plan in the paradise, it is a restatement that even in God's perfect plan in the paradise of Eden, Adam was formed first before Eve, and he says that's important even when we come down to this relationship within the New Testament church, which I will cover on Sunday. And he gives the reason, and Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in the transgression, and I'll cover that on Sunday. So all I'm doing is making the point, all the way from the creation of the Old Testament, all the way into the New Testament church, and we're in the New Testament church today, we cannot ignore the fact that Adam was made first. There is a responsibility, there is an accountability, and an authority in that fact that must still be recognized even into the very practice, our day-to-day -day practice in the 21st century New Testament church. So Eve was created as a helper for Adam, not Adam for Eve. So important. So important. Now, already, you know, I don't even know how uncomfortable that may make our women in here tonight. I'd like to think not because you've been subject to biblical teaching. But you just go, you could go into probably 90% of churches in this nation, so called. And get about as far as I've taught right now, and I'd be getting ushered off the platform behind the plexiglass board, thrown out some kind of mad fanatic that has no place in the 21st century. Now, I've just given scripture, right? I haven't given really any interpretation whatsoever. It's just scripture with scripture with scripture. So what's really happening? God is being thrown out of the New Testament church. That's the problem. The society... And the doctrine of society, i.e. the doctrine of this present evil world, is becoming the doctrine of the so-called New Testament church. And the filth and fluff of the world is filling the church with stuff and nonsense, and it's being flooded to the point where the Bible is floating on the flood and being thrown overboard and outside, and anybody who happens to be hanging on to the Bible at the time, they're getting thrown overboard as well. Isn't that what we're seeing? in our world today, in our churches today. May the Lord help us not to be shown. So Eve, uh, Eve was created as a, as a helper for Adam, not Adam for Eve. Adam, not Eve, is, is accountable, accountable to God as the single federal head of the human race. And by federal, I mean overall. Adam, the progenitor, is held accountable to God and by God for everything that is wrong, if you will, that went wrong with the human race. Not Eve. 
not Eve. Adam is held accountable. Adam is held responsible because his role and he failed in the role that God had given him in the role that God had given to him. And we know that because we're still in Genesis. Go to Genesis 3. Who sinned first? Don't say Satan. Who sinned first here on earth? Look at verse number 6. We won't read it all. Again, familiar text, sake of time tonight. We know this is the, the tenting of Satan, the guiding of Eve. Look at verse number 6. And when the woman saw that the tree, the tree of the knowledge of good or evil, the one that God had told them not to take the fruit of, otherwise they would surely die. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was pleasant to the eyes and the tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat and gave also unto her husband with her and he did eat. Who sinned first? Eve. Eve. She took the forbidden fruit. I mean, in the law of scripture, Eve sinned first. Eve was beguiled, corrupted by the whisperings of Satan and entered into the sin of taking that fruit. Adam did it with knowledge, and he did it second. Adam knew that he shouldn't have done it. Adam knew that Eve shouldn't have done it. But Adam chose to sin regardless. So he kind of pictures a lot of Christians today, doesn't he? Just choose to sin regardless of the fact that they know specifically there are things that they shouldn't do, yet they choose to do it anyway. But Eve knew that she shouldn't do it, but she allowed herself to be emotionally manipulated because of the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. She allowed herself to do that. Eve sinned first, but who is held accountable for that sin? Romans chapter 5, verse number 12. Okay, what we should read now is the reason for the state we're in today, the reason for sin in the world, the person responsible and accountable to God, we should read that it's Eve, because she was beguiled by Satan against what she'd been told, took the fruit first before Anna. Right? Verse number 12, wherefore as by one man, well, at that point, is that man generically? Is that Eve? Wherefore as by one man, sin entered into the world and death by sin and so death passed upon all men for that all have sinned. Well sin has passed upon men and women so you might say, now we know from the context of that verse we'll read the rest of it, we know what it's talking about but go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15 see scripture with scripture leaves us in no doubt, no room for little egalitarian wriggles trying to make scripture say what it doesn't trying to make one word mean something else 1 Corinthians 15, verse number 22. <clears throat> For as in Adam all die. Adam. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. Not only that, Christ is called what? The last Adam. Adam is held accountable by God for the entrance of sin into the world. But Eve sinned first. But God holds Adam accountable. Were Adam and Eve equal in personhood before God, in the image of God? Absolutely. Were they equal in role? No. Were they equal in responsibility? No. Were they equal in accountability? No. Now that's sort of a yes or no, but no overall. Because Eve, like every one of us as Christians, male or female, we are accountable to God for ourselves. We are responsible to God for ourselves. And we have an authority in our lives that is given to us. But overall, there was a difference in that role, responsibility, and accountability for Adam right from the beginning, right from the perfect creation of paradise. But at creation, at creation, at the beginning, male 
and female were equal in their value before God. Did that change after the fall? No. No. But we do see things have got different over the years, of course. Uh, we find the attitude of dominance sometimes. We find the attitude of superiority. We find even in the Bible, God's plan, the Bible for marriage and womanhood and fatherhood and manhood and woman. We find even sinful actions through the Old Testament as a result of sin and the fall and cultural logic. You know, there are many reasons and there are many unbiblical scholars, i.e., you know, people maybe theologians and I say they'll go through the Old Testament and tell you all the reasons why people did what they did and why it made sense to do what they did. But when they did what they did, it made sense to do what they did and it went against the word of God. It wasn't right. It was sin. And God did not condone it. But those things were the result of sin. They were not a result of a change in God's position. God never changed his position. And they were not as a result of a change in God's perception. God didn't change his position on things, and he didn't change the way he viewed things. Yes, people found common grace even in sin under the Lord. Sometimes they did, sometimes they didn't. At other times, God would bring sweeping judgment upon that sin. But we find many of the attitudes and the traditions that crept in were a result of sin. And then, of course, specifically, we look at very much how a lot of those traditions replace God's biblical truths even down through the nation of Israel. So much so, of course, that the Lord uh, lambasted them for making those traditions. Uh, they were teaching the commandments of men, weren't they? But we find even today when we look at this matter of how the value of male and female has been so corrupted. We even find it today, and it's particularly uh, prominent at this, or relevant at this point in time, in the matter of so-called uh, the freedom of women to choose what happens in their own bodies. Abortion. You know, that's freedom of choice, that's making women equal. It gives them, actually, beyond equality, it gives them independence because a woman's body is her own body and she can do what she likes and it doesn't matter what her husband says, she's even got one, etc., etc. It's just a satanic deception. And I'll tell you how I know that because it goes against God's value of the equality for male and female. Because in this matter of abortion, in many cultures, it has promulgated gender-specific abortion. I.e., there's nothing wrong with the baby, there is nothing wrong with the mother, they're not in terrible social circumstances, there aren't any one of the host of myriad of excuses that people generally give for having an abortion. There's a man and a woman, they're married, they have a home, but they live in a culture where either the births, the number of births are restricted, or there is some poverty and therefore the value of a male child is listed as higher. So they will find out that the woman is pregnant with a female child and they will abort the child, murder the child, based on the fact that it's female. Now, is that is that God's plan? No way. Because in God's eyes, the male and female are equally valuable in his sight. They just have a difference of role. But that's been taken to the extremity to say that one role is far more important than the other, so nothing to do with the accountability, it's to do with the, the authority that's exceeded or the usefulness that will get rid of the woman. So we know that all the way back in creation, we've got equality in value in the eyes of the Lord. Well, what about as we come forward an equality and responsibility then in the eyes of the law under the Old Testament? In the eyes of the Lord, at the beginning we see that. What about the law was brought in through Moses to the nation of Israel? What was God's plan for women in the nation of Israel? The patriarchy was, you know, was God's plan, well, you know, the patriarchy is good. I want it to be as misogynistic as possible. You really need to hate women. Just use them as slaves and servants as sex objects. Chuck them out when they're no use to you. Get as many as you can in your harem. Uh, and, you know, have as many male children as you can because they'll be useful. And the girls can go and fetch the waters from the well and all that kind of stuff. <clears throat> what was God's plan under the eyes of the law? Do we see that it retained 
that equality in that area that is so often attacked as being patriarchal, misogynistic, bad, and therefore plays into something that must be thrown out, and the God of the Old Testament is somehow different to the God of the New Testament. Under the law, men and women in Israel bore the same responsibility to obey the law. You know, even if you take the Ten Commandments, there weren't the Ten Commandments for the men, none for the women. They both, male and female, were under obligation to obey the law. So what was that equality? God held them equally responsible to obey the law. They couldn't have a position whereby the woman could say, well, my husband, who's the head, the leader of our home, he never told me these things, so I'm sorry I picked up sticks on the Sabbath. Uh, yeah, flip, hold off on the stone. I'm sorry I committed adultery. Didn't get that one. Uh, you know, I plead ignorance. Didn't work with God. Men and women equally accountable under the law. You see, they were both equally accountable to teach the law to the children. Weren't they? Deuteronomy 6, let's just go there. Deuteronomy chapter 6. The command was not just given to men to teach the children. Deuteronomy 6, verse number 4, Hear, O Israel, that was the whole of Israel, men and women. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, one Lord over men, one Lord over the women. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy might. That was men and women. And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart. Men and women, you obey these, have them in your heart. Verse 7, and thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children, and shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house, and when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up all day long. And thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thine hand, and they shall be fragments between thine eyes. He said the plan of the home was for the children to be taught those things and spoken of those things all day long. Well, I've got news for you. Back in those days, it wasn't like today, and you had men sitting around all day with their feet up on benefits playing PlayStation while the women went out and did other stuff. The men went to work during the day. The command was as much upon the women as it was the men to teach the children the commandments of the Lord, the word of God to the children. Now, if you're not convinced by that, just go to Proverbs chapter 6, just one more one more verse to, to now that home. In fact, Sam referenced it uh, just the other day. Proverbs 6, verse number 20. <clears throat> My son, keep thy father's commandment. Ah, there you see, it wasn't to the women, it was just the men. And forsake not the law of thy, what's that next word? Mother. Husband and wife, mother and father, equally called to obey the law. Husband and wife, mother and father, equally called to teach God's law to the children. Equally. Now, that's the same equality that we had in the beginning, but if there was a failure, who did God hold more accountable than the other? The husband was the leader and the head. Both were guilty. One was more guilt, the husband, because he had a greater accountability and a greater responsibility because as Adam was formed first, then Eve, as God gave Adam additional authority and responsibility, then still in that same equality, then in the Old Testament under the law, male and female were to observe God's laws equally. Male and female were to teach the children just as importantly, just as equally. But the man had that extra accountability and responsibility if his family were not running the way that it should go. So men have an additional accountability, you see. So we find, uh, uh, but again, another one just to show that equality. Go to Numbers, uh, Numbers, chapter 6. Now, this was the greatest vow that an Israelite could take, right? Numbers, chapter 6. The vow of a Nazarite. 
That was held to be, if you will, the most holy vow that an Israelite could take. You know, no eating raisins, no cutting your hair. All you can read through. You know these things. You don't need me to run through all that. I'm just making the point about the equality of the vow. Numbers chapter six, verse number one. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying. Speak unto the children of Israel and say unto them, when either, and I've got this highlighted and circled, man or woman shall separate themselves to vow a vow of a Nazarite, to separate themselves unto the Lord, the vow of a Nazarite to a man or a woman to separate themselves unto the Lord, he shall separate himself from wine, and strong drink, and shall drink no vinegar of wine, or vinegar of strong drink, neither shall drink any liquor of grapes, nor eat moist grapes, or dry. This, this was how prescriptive this vow was. This is how important this vow of separation was to God. It was so important, you would think that under the patriarchal system of the Old Testament, under the necessity of men to lead their families, men only in the priesthood, surely this most important of vows in the Old Testament, surely then, under this terrible patriarchal misogynistic system, would only apply to the men. But it didn't. God said, equally, man or woman. A lot of people miss that in the vow of Nazareth. I'm not really sure why, but a lot of people do, I've spoken to in the past. So what I'm saying, I'm saying in creation, that equality in the eyes, under the eyes of the Lord, under the Old Testament, they had equality and responsibility under the eyes of the Lord. Both men and women had the same protections under the law, as well as the same judgments, didn't they? They were protected under the law equally. You know, very much that whole point. You know, uh, one court in the act of adultery, it had to be the man and the woman brought forth before the witnesses. So the same protections, the same penalties were upon both. We have that equality, but some difference still from the creation in responsibility and accountability, but in value before the Lord still equal. This difference of roles, you see, this is what we're talking about because under the Old Testament law, the priesthood was exclusively male. The Aaronic, Levitical priesthood. No female priest. Non, zip, nil, nana. No exceptions to the rule, no exceptions in scripture, no exceptions in the outline. There's no, you know, kind of odd one like a Deborah that slips up in the priesthood. No, no. Complete difference of role. Priesthood was male. But both male and female, both men and women, made up the choir that would lead people to sing in praise to the glory of God. So you see, there's a difference in Nehemiah 7, just in case you've missed that one. Uh, Nehemiah, chapter 1 and 2, verse Nehemiah 7. And of course, what we're dealing with there uh, in that part of the book, Nehemiah, we purification, they're, they're running through the genealogies, they're throwing out anybody who shouldn't have been where they should have been, anybody who shouldn't have been with them, they shouldn't have been with anybody who was in the priesthood, so they're purifying everything, so this is a real clarifying text, and that's why it's quite authoritative uh, in its context. Uh, Nehemiah 7 and verse 67. <clears throat> so we're coming in way down the list, you can go back in your own time and read it if you don't know the context here. Beside their manservants and their maidservants, of whom there were 7,337, and they had 245 singing men and singing women. So God outlines differences in the roles. In some things, he allows the women to participate because they have this absolute equality in value, but that still doesn't stop. God given a difference in role. It doesn't make them unequal in value, but there is a difference in role. No woman could be in the priesthood, but they could be in the choir. So we see these things are not new. They go all the way back to creation. They come all the way through the Old Testament. So when we get into the New Testament, God didn't just suddenly throw everything out the window and end up with the kind of New Testament crazy churches that we've got today. God still expected his biblical role that he gave from creation 
He's amended and changed them, but nonetheless, they're still there. He expects them to be just as importantly observed in the New Testament where he draws a distinction in role, responsibility, or accountability. It wasn't a, if you feel like it, but just let the ladies do it if you don't feel like it. You know, if you feel it might get you into an argument, pastor, then sling the Bible out the window and just make it easy. It's not the case. You know, Lord Jesus Christ said, I mentioned it earlier, we won't turn there, Matthew 15, 9, but in vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. That was his criticism of the Pharisees because the nation of Israel had reached a point where you could actually, by their traditions, not God's word, you could have said God didn't value women as equally as he did men. But that had nothing to do with God's word. That was just to do with male dominance that had gone beyond the realms of scripture and other matters as well, but in that matter. You know, women weren't greatly valued. As a rule, not by the rabbis, not by the Pharisees. They lost that picture of what God had given in creation and under the law. So that just brings us, we've got time to quickly finish tonight. So we looked at the eyes, uh, under the eyes of the Lord in creation, under the eyes of the law in the Old Testament. That brings us briefly then to equality, dignity, and responsibility under grace. Yes, I know there's always been grace, but under the age of grace, under the gospel of the grace of the church age. Well, firstly and foremostly, now we will unpack this verse on Sunday, but let's go to the obvious one, and that is there is no restriction or supremacy in salvation to men and a limitation on women. Galatians 3.28. We'll just read this tonight. We might unpack it a bit more on Sunday. We may not, but we'll just read it. It's the key place to start. We might as well start with God's plan of salvation. Galatians 3. Where did we get that? <clears throat> I'm trying to avoid Galatians because one verse throws my whole three out the theological system out the window. Galatians 3, verse number 28. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female, for you're all one in Christ Jesus. Now, that isn't a verse for the trained Christian. Oh, look at that. There's no men and there's no women. Of course it's not. In the context, what it's saying is when you come to Christ, we're all equal at the foot of the cross. Rich or poor. You know, bond or free, servant or master, Jew or Gentile, Jew or Greek, Gentile, male or female, absolute equality at Calvary's cross. No, 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 no kind of uh, uh, favoritism of the man. You know, God's really hoping that more men than women will be saved because the men are more important than the women. If that were the case, something's gone really wrong in Christianity. <clears throat> okay, God says, creation. Old Testament under the law, equal in value under the New Testament dispensation of the gospel of the grace of God in Christ Jesus at the foot of the cross. It makes no difference to God. He's no respect to a person, whether you're rich or poor, Jew or Gentile, male or female. Salvation is for whosoever will call upon the name of the Lord. Absolute equality in New Testament salvation. No supremacy, no favoritism to man. Equality. Now go to 1 Corinthians 12. I'm just looking at a couple of verses tonight. I just wanted to get a few, few laid down. Just to say that, you know, God's, God's plan in terms of equality and the value of male and female hasn't changed from creation all the way through the scripture. In fact, I'll show you it doesn't even change at the tribulation, either tonight or Sunday. We'll see how time goes. Where did I just say we were going? Uh, 1 Corinthians 12. 1 Corinthians 12. Absolute equality in salvation, Corinthians 12, verse number 13. For by one spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been all made to drink into one spirit. Absolute equality in salvation, 
absolute equality in the baptism by the Holy Spirit of God into the body of Christ. Male, female, Jew, Gentile, doesn't matter, rich, poor. Exact equality in what we are allowed to receive from the Lord. Acts chapter 1, verse 14. You've heard me refer to this very often. There is some difference uh, of the way that verse is interpreted by, by different people. But regardless of how you interpret it into church practice today, it still says something uniquely specific under grace. Acts 1 verse 14, these all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brethren. Absolute equality at the prayer meeting. The men and the women were praying together. You say, so what? You couldn't do that as a Jew at the temple. The women were separated from men, just like Islam today. The women were not valued at a time of prayer. The women weren't valued at a time of teaching. It was kind of like, quite frankly, if you went to the temple, it was almost like the men were like, well, I'm going and you can come if you, if you want to. How different the New Testament church. Imagine if, if, if all the Christian men were, well, I'm off to church this week, you know, you, you don't have to come. What madness that would be. We'd be encouraging our wives to forsake the assembly and ourselves together. Nothing could be further from the New Testament picture. What I'm saying is in the New Testament church, God says, man, woman, equal at salvation. Man, woman, equal baptismal uh, uh, placement into the body of Christ. Prayer meeting. Man, woman, equal at the prayer meeting. Now, that doesn't run across all areas of the worship service in the way that practices. We're going to look at that on Sunday, all right? But what I'm saying is God is saying equality, equality. Difference in role, difference in responsibility, equality in value before God of both body and soul. And let's just say very, very quickly tonight, if it was like that in creation, if it was like that under the law, and it was like that in the church age, when the church is raptured, what do you think it's going to be like in the Great Tribulation? Think God's still going to have an equality for male and female in the Great Tribulation? Yes, he is. We can stay in the book of Acts. Should have said that before I turned, shouldn't I? Acts chapter 2, where we're dealing with Peter's wrong hermeneutics about the prophecy of Joel chapter 2. God allows Peter to make a mistake in his theological interpretation. And Peter thought the prophecy of Joel 2 had been fulfilled at Pentecost. It wasn't. It wasn't. You know why? Because the things didn't all happen. That's a whole different lesson. But God allows us to see, of course, that even, even the leaders of the first church can get messed up on their doctrine when they just get a little bit too excited. But it shows us something about the time of great tribulation on this matter of equality of male and female in this outline of the prophecy. Acts chapter 2, verse number 16, I want to think. Yes. But this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. And it shall come to pass in the last days. When's the last days? Not yet. Yeah, not yet. But we're, in, we're, we're cops. Well, this is specifically telling us which last days. This isn't the last days of the church. And it shall come to pass, in the last days, saith God, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your, what's that next word? Daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams, and on my servants and on my handmaidens, I will pour out in those days of my spirit, and they shall prophesy, and I will show wonders in the heaven above, and signs in the earth beneath blood, fire, and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness, the moon into blood, before that great and notable day of the Lord shall come. And I only read those verses to tell you that's how I know Peter was wrong, because those things didn't happen. So God shows that even Peter had got that wrong. It's some of it that came true, because the kingdom was still on offer in Acts chapter 7. But we're not going to go into all of that, all right? So that is still yet to come. So we find he's talking about the great and notable day of the Lord. He's talking about the, the time of great tribulation. He's talking about all those terrible things that will happen. And even in that period of time, God says, still, I will have 
and equality of value, we still see a difference in role in many of the roles, but an equality in value even through the time of great tribulation. So, men and women have a quality of value, a quality of standing, a quality of access, therefore being justified by faith. That peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ and through that verse we have access to his strong by grace, don't we, men and women? What then is the difference? Role. Well, and to some degree, accountability. Men and women have different roles, and men have a difference in accountability. Now, we could say so much more on this, and we need to go to Ephesians 5, and we'd have to go through all the wedding council and all that kind of thing. That takes weeks and weeks and weeks to do those things. But we're just laying down a picture here. Equality of standing, equality of value, equality of access to the form of grace, difference of role, different accountability. Men have additional accountability for their additional responsibility of headship and leadership of their families. This doesn't make a woman any less equal in her life before God or in her role before God. Her role is not less equal, it's just different. It's not the same. Of course, we can speak so much about that. But it does render the man more accountable. There's no getting away from that because Adam was created first. And that's just the way that it was. We're both subject to different roles and different rules and regulations, even in the New Testament church. But that's not a difference in equality of value. And we of all people as Christians, Bible-believing Christians, we should understand and we should celebrate God's roles of male and female. We should celebrate that difference, rejoice in that difference, encourage that difference, take the men who are more like women and make them biblical men and take the women who are more like men and make them biblical women. We do not just accept it to remain the way it is in this messed up world where you've got a bunch of tattooed heifers running around acting like violent men, where you've got a bunch of effeminate, wimpy men running around like a bunch of women who don't know how to do anything and can't get themselves off the couch, then when they come to the Lord, they're all equal at the cross, they're equal in salvation, they come in, and then we turn them and we push them and we preach them and we teach them how to be biblical men and biblical women and we respect that difference and we promote that difference because God continues to want that difference. And that is not making one less equal than the other. It is making us as different as we should have been all the way from creation and should be even today in the 21st century. Now, apparently, we had an English ladies football team won something, uh, there was something. Now, when one played, well, I'm not even going to get into that one. I didn't know anything about it, didn't see it, and don't feel the need to. But I just saw a photograph on the paper. I think it was on the newspaper. Might be on my feed, whatever, mum's newspaper. And I looked, and it was lionesses, this, that, and the other. And I saw these, you like, bah! And tattoos, and I was like, you look like men. I can see you've got long hair, but in character, they're nearly men, aren't they? And we're celebrating this. We're celebrating this. Oh, pastor, get with the times. No, you get with the times. I'm not against women in sport, women in sport. I'm, I'm not even saying that. I'm not even going to go down that. I've got some issues with a lot of it, but I'm not even going to go into that. All I'm saying is I heard all this for all. I know nothing about them. I saw one photograph thought they looked like a bunch of aggressive footballing men. How long before they look shaving heads, tattoos, and you're going, are they men, are they women? What are they? Like? We should celebrate, celebrate biblical manhood, biblical femininity, and regardless of whether these things happen to fit with the world's mindset or not, we will celebrate them, we will promote them, we will adhere to them, we will encourage them, and we will go down fighting for them because I'll tell you what, the world is not a better place than it was 40 years ago. And that's because primarily the breakdown of the roles and the breakdown of the family you want to offer to me our 21st century society as much better than God's biblical roles, then I suggest you get a better example because 
it's a mess. Help us. God help us. God help our ladies on Sunday if they've never heard this stuff before, not to get all bent out of shape. Because it's, you know, I'm going to go light, but to some, it, it could be quite shocking if they've never heard these things before. Silence is one of the words. Wow. We've got to understand the context. We've got to understand God's plan. May he help us. I know that's going to a little long, but I wanted to get that down so that somebody somewhere has got context back up for Sunday, all the bits that aren't going to be in Sunday school. Father, we, we thank you, Lord. Father, you, you have no problem with the identity of who you created, male and female, and that's it. You have no problem with the identity. You have no problem with the roles. Adam had federal headship. He was to be the leader. And his wife was created to be a help to him to do all that you called him to do. And Father, that is husband and wife in unity and imperfection, as you call us to be even today. But we live in this sin cursed, sinful fallen world. And Lord, we fall short as men and as women. But I, Lord, I, I pray in particular throughout tonight and Sunday as we look at a part of the role of biblical women, women professing godliness. Lord, society doesn't put a value on it anymore, but I pray, Lord, that we do. I pray that your church will put value and emphasis where you put value and emphasis. And if that doesn't suit this world, Lord, then so be it. But I pray, God, that it will suit us. Help us to change, to become who you would have us to become. And, Lord, this world truly will see a difference. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen.